What is up, YouTube? This is Red Leprechaun Gaming, and welcome back to He Who Fights with Monsters, Book 2 by Shirtaloo. We're on Chapter 70, Domineering, Territorial, and Robust. For those who could afford them, personal transportation in Jayapura consisted of platter-sized discs that floated in the air, underfoot, the rider directing them by shifting their weight. Hester brought a number of them out into an open area of the lawn for her visitors to get a handle on. Hoverboards, Jason called out cheerfully. They're actually called a personal float disc, Clive corrected him. Hoverboards! That's not. Hoverboards, Jason asserted again. Stash turned into a bird and flew onto Jason's head, echoing his cry. Hoverboards! Good boy, Jason said, giving the bird Stash a biscuit. Smaller float discs, like the one Hester had brought out, were for standing on. She explained that there were larger ones, each of which had a seat on them. Use of one of those by any other than the physically infirm were looked down upon, however. Humphrey and Clive had used them before, and Sophie and Jason found their balance quickly. Neil and Belinda had more trouble. They struggled to get their disc to even move, only for it to shoot out from under them as it did. While they continued to practice, Jason skimmed around the edges of the yard, giggling like a madman. Hoverboards, he said happily, pulling up next to Clive. Why do we not have these in Greenstone? The magical density is too low, Clive said. It's why the magical vehicles need someone like me to drive them. Doesn't that make your ability useless here, Jason asked? Clive grinned. You need someone like me to drive that, Clive said, pointing up. Jason looked into the sky, where what looked like a full-sized zeppelin was floating gracefully through the sky. Instead of an inflated envelope of air, it had what looked like a wire frame of an air envelope, visibly glowing with magic. Awesome! Eventually, Hester judged Neil and Belinda ready for strictly supervised use of the float discs, and they started down the hill and into the city, careful for the benefit of Belinda and Neil. Did we have to start off downhill, Neil asked nervously, as he controlled his disc? Not to say I don't agree with the sentiment, Belinda said, likewise moving with caution. It might be a bit much to ask Hester to move her house somewhere flatter for our benefit, though. Hester led them into the city, passing through older and older sections as they moved closer to the center. Their destination was the Mystic Quarter, where the city's main temples were located, along with the Magic and Adventure Society campuses. The Adventure Society Trade Hall should be the best, best place to find most of what you're after, Hester told them. You may need Magic Society for some of the ritual components in any case. The trade hall brokers will take the, all the loot off your hands if you'd care to trade it. The Adventure Society campus dwarfed that of Greenstones, although it lacked the open simplicity. Instead, it was a warren of tight alleys and narrow streets, with buildings hugging together like goods bundled into a crate. It was more like a town, the trade hall alone the size of a village. You should enjoy this, Humphrey, Jason said as they moved through the crowds of the main trade hall. Unlike Greenstone, there's no one to recognize you. You can just be some guy here. After visiting the brokers, they spent some time shopping around. Jason's group chat allowed them to stay in contact when they split up. They moved through the crowded trading hall, the maelstrom of voices all around them hawking and haggling. Does anyone have any crystal wash? They heard a voice call out. Everywhere seems to be sold out all of a sudden. Jason looked a little shifty on hearing this, and did his best to continue shopping nonchalantly. The team regrouped outside the trade hall to compare purchases. They had only bought a few things, as their main purpose was to hand over their awakening stones and essences to the brokers for auction. There was a market enough that the auctions took place daily, so they'd be able to collect their earnings in the morning. I got a line on a magical tattooist with the skills I need, Jason said. Someone who can apply the immortal crest. The Immortal Crest was an item Jason obtained during the trials that was unusual in nature. Using it required the services of a specialist magics craftsperson, none of whom resided in Greenstone. Humphrey had used one himself while traveling with his mother. Item. Immortal Crest. Iron Rank. Rare. An object that allows the soul to mark the body. Consumable. Tattoo. Effect. When applied by a mystical tattooist, this item will draw out a soul crest. The item can only be used on an iron rank essence user. What are you doing? After acquiring the item Jason had asked Clive about, 
it. Clive, in turn, had roped in Humphrey, who already had a soul crest. A soul crest, they explained, was a magical tattoo printed not on the body but on the soul. That imprint would appear on the body in turn in the form of that uh, resist in the form that resisted design. The form of the crest was a visible refer reflection of the bearer's true nature. The crest was used as a form of identification. The unique imprint of the aura remained the same, even if the aura itself changed in the visible form of the crest with it. Impossible to track or falsify, though even with the strongest of magic, so long as there was a record of the imprint, it was a guaranteed proof of identity. Immortal crests were difficult and expensive to make, especially for an iron rank item, but many wealthy adventurers commissioned one nonetheless. Once the Adventure Society had a record of the imprint, it was an ironclad proof of identity that could be verified in any branch in the entire world. The visible form of the crest would not be chosen. Instead, it reflected the soul that had produced it. This had famously re mixed results. If we're going to see a magical tattooist, Humphrey said, then you should all get one. I already did when I used my immortal crest. As a group, they decided to make their next stop. Clive explained magical tattoos as they traversed the city on their hover discs. It'll only last as long as your current rank, Clive told them. It gets purged from your body as you rank up, along with any other magical waste that doesn't hold up to your new rank. That leaves you free to get a new tattoo at your new rank. What do they do? Belinda asked. I've heard of magical tattoos, but never seen one. We can change that, Humphrey said. He pulled back his sleeve to show an intricate sigil on his upper arm, confident enough in his skill with the floating disc to do so without falling off. The tattoo's color was a brilliant shade of blue that shimmered like sunlight on the ocean. Different tattoos do different things, Clive said. That looks like a mana accumulating one. That's right, Humphrey said. It slowly accumulates mana, which I can absorb when I need it. It's basically a mana potion that takes a few hours to refill itself. The functions of iron rank tattoos are quite basic, Clive explained. So most people go from some variant on health or mana recovery be that a moderate increase to natural recovery, or an on-demand burst like Humphrey has there, the cooldown of an ability, a short burst of damage reduction or reducing the cooldown of an ability. Effects like that are single-use and take an amount of time to recover before being used again. How many can you get? Sophie asked. Just the one, Clive said. Usually, anyway. There are essence abilities that can increase that. My rune essence, for example, will frequently produce that type of ability. I didn't get one of those, though. Following the directions Jason had obtained, Hester guided them away from the main areas of the Mystic Corridor, the streets growing narrower and the buildings older as they went. Are you sure the place we're going is legitimate? Neil asked Jason. Are you kidding? Jason asked. Mysterious shopkeepers in dilapidated parts of the city are where most where most people would never tread are always better. According to whom? Neil asked. 80s movies. 80 what? I'll assess the place for myself, Hester said. They found the tattoo shop, and while the dingy exterior was not confidence-inducing, the interior was a stark contrast. They walked into a room with, a pol with polished wood, shining tiles, and glass as pristine as a cloudless winter sky. Hung on the walls were pictures of various tattoos, some artistic, others with descriptions of their effects. If the craftsmanship we can expect is a match for what's on display here, Clive said, examining the pictures, then I don't foresee any problems. Agreed, Hester said, likewise looking over the displays. She turned to Jason. Who told you about this place? I was asking around the trade hall, Jason said. I couldn't much tell good advice from the bad, so I tried something else. They don't differentiate the trade hall by rank like they do back in Greenstone. It's all mixed together here. So I started for looking places that seemed less impressive than you'd expect at the trade hall. Eventually, I found a place that didn't look like much, and everyone seemed to ignore, but every single person I saw in there was a top-flight adventurer. It was all silver and gold rankers, the kind who have plain-looking gear that you can tell is actually the good stuff if you pay attention. So I went in, had a little chat, and the guy running it gave me a tip. Just like that, Sophie asked. Well, I did have to promise to send Neil in for a special visit. What? Neil asked. It'll be fine, Jason said. They really like the sound of a chunky elf. We should start by looking for a sailor suit soon, though, because finding one in your size might be tricky. They? I think he had some mates he wanted to bring along. 
the more the merrier, right? You know, someone is going to tie you to a boulder and drop you in the ocean one day, Neil said. That's fine, Jason said. As it turns out, I don't need air to breathe. A wiry woman emerged from the back room. She looked older, but hale and weathered like a tree that had survived storm after storm. Jason was unable to detect any aura from her at all. I was wondering who was making a commotion in my shop, she said, looking at them over. Not a lot of boisterous youths docking my door, accompanied by Hester Marala, no less. The lady from the house on the hill. Are you still following that Bahadira boy around, she asked. You know a mirror, Hester asked. No, might be a strong word, the woman said. We crossed paths when he was a, still a precious boy. Good to hear he took up treasure hunting, because he was only a so-so adventurer. That couple he ran with, though, now they knew their business. The sneaky one, too. Gabrielle and Arabella Ramor, Jason said. We'll be seeing them soon if you'd like to pass on a greeting. Oh, they don't want to hear from so some old shopkeeper, she said. Who is it that sent you my way? The man selling magic lamps in the trade hall. And you were the one who got it out of him, she asked. He probably saw you were an outworlder and got all excitable, the damn coot. I'm Jason Asarno. May I have your name? Tilly is good enough. You didn't come here for just tattoos, Jason Asarno. You'd get them plenty of places, cheaper and easier. Jason took out a plain metal plate and handed it over. Immortal Crest, Tilly said, turning it over in her hands. Who made this? Me, kind of, Jason said. Looting ability of sorts. Of weird sorts to produce something like this. All right, I can get you sorted out once we've settled the matter of price. And that is, Jason asked. Is the chunky elf in the sailor suit on the table? Jason blinked in surprise, then burst out laughing. God's damn you, Asarno, Neil said. The price is money, of course, Tilly said with a twinkle in her eye. It's a tattoo shop. It'll be a wheelbarrow full of coins for an immortal crest in a day or two to get the things ready. Once today's auctions have gone through, we'll have wheelbarrows of cash to spare, Jason said. In the meantime, we'll get some enchanted tattoos. Tilly took them back into a workroom with a big chair that looked like it came from the office of a really scary dentist. On a table next to it were laid out a series of very large needles, pots of oils, unguents, and powders. More jars and pots were crammed together on shelves lining the walls with no visible organizational system. Light poured from the large skylight over their heads. You first, Tilly said to Humphrey. Shirt off. I already have a tattoo, Humphrey said. I don't care, she said. I want to look at that soul crest. The price of me doing one for your friend. Humphrey tugged his shirt off, revealing his impressive physique. Damn, Humphrey, Jason said. I didn't realize you waxed your chest. I don't wax my chest. You do seem oddly hairless, Belinda said. Do you get that hair removal cream from Jory? No. I think he has some kind of magic crystal he uses for shaving, Jason said. Will you please stop talking about my chest hair? You don't have any chest hair, Belinda said. That's kind of the whole point. Stop gabbing and turn around, Tilly told Humphrey, who was clearly relieved to do so. Humphrey, Humphrey revealed a startling image on his back, a rainbow-colored dragon on a great sand-colored shield. The dragon's scales glimmered in the light, making it seem like a living thing. Whoever drew this knew their business, T Tilly assessed. This is the Vitesse style. Was it Kiplinson? You can tell that just by looking at it, Humphrey said. I thought the image was determined by the soul. It is, Tilly said. It's shaped by the artist that drew out your soul, though. Kiplinson was a good choice, but he doesn't work for just anyone. He must have good family connections. His mom's kind of a big deal, Jason said. Lucky for some, Tilly said. You next, Asano. I need to know what I'm dealing with to make the right preparations. Shut off. Jason looked at Humphrey and self-consciously removed his shirt. Jason's body was as fit as it had ever been, but still looked flabby and meager next to Humphrey. How is that fair, Jason said. You look like some famous sculpture brought to life by a witch to steal my girlfriend. You don't have a girlfriend, Humphrey said. Rub it in, why don't you? Tilly shoved Jason around and prodded at his back with her wizened fingers. You shouldn't get anything too embarrassing as a crest. You wouldn't believe the number of sheltered young idiots that get an immortal crest and aren't happy when it reveals who they truly are. But yours will do, make no mistake. If you don't think you can handle seeing your true nature, then I'd stop here. It is what it is, Jason said. Worst case, shirts are a thing. Interesting aura, Tilly said, continuing to ply Jason's back. 
Domineering and territorial. Robust, especially for your rank. Something else, too. Are you some kind of priest? The whole team laughed. He's definitely not, Neil said. If anything, he's the exact opposite. Then it's a little odd to find a touch of the divine on you. I've been touched by the gods, all right, Jason said. They're quite handsy once you get to know them. And that's the end of chapter 70. I'll see you guys in the next video. Until then, have fun, guys.